Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. Today, we can finally share with you the official information on Intel's 10th gen desktop processors in their Comet Lake lineup. This has been a long time coming. I'm sure many of you have seen a ton of leaks for these chips over the last few months. But we're here, no more leaks, this is the official info, and we'll be sharing a few of our thoughts on what Intel is offering along the way. Before that though, quick plug for our Harbour Boxton Hammer on Box merch, which is still available for the next few days if you're interested. Great way to support the channel and grab some comfortable, awesome looking t-shirts and hoodies. Check all that stuff out, links in the description below. Let's just jump straight into the lineup here and have a look at what Intel is offering. And then later we'll go back and have a look at some of the new features and the new 400 series chipsets that Intel are offering. Right at the top of the product stack, Intel are offering a new 10 core 20 thread processor. Well, actually a bunch of processors because Intel has heavily segmented their lineup as always. There's the Core i9 10900K, which is an unlocked model with an integrated GPU, the i9 10900KF, which offers the same functionality with no iGPU, and then two locked models in the i9 10900 and i9 10900F, which offer an iGPU and no iGPU respectively. We're still looking at a Skylake derivative architecture here, built on 14 nanometer technology, so there's no major changes here to things like IPC or CPU features. We are seeing a minor increase to supported memory, now up to DDR4-2933 for Core i9 and Core i7 models, although this isn't really that important as Intel CPUs easily support faster memory and have done so with previous generations too. For clock speeds, there are lots of different specifications here, which is quite confusing. I wish Intel would just simplify all these numbers into just a few metrics. So for single core turbo speeds, Intel are listing three metrics. There is the normal turbo boost speed of 5.1 gigahertz, then the turbo boost 3.0 speed of 5.2 gigahertz, and the Intel thermal velocity boost turbo of 5.3 gigahertz. So depending on what features you have available to you and the temperature of the CPU, you'll see clocks between 5.1 and 5.3 gigahertz peak on these parts. That top 5.3 gigahertz speed will only be available at temperatures below 70 degrees Celsius as part of thermal velocity boost. As for all core turbos, Intel is listing that at 4.8 gigahertz for the 10900KF with a 4.9 gigahertz speed possible with thermal velocity boost. While the TDP of this chip is 125 watts, realistically the 10900K and KF will use far more power at that 4.8 gigahertz all core frequency, especially as Intel are basically adding two cores to the 9900K at a similar frequency. That higher TDP does allow for a higher base clock though. For pricing, the K and KF models are coming in around 490 and 470 US dollars tray pricing, so that's replacing the 9900K and 9900KF in the lineup. It's unclear what these chips will actually retail at in boxed models, but you'd expect similar-ish pricing to what's listed on Intel slide. This, as expected, places the 10 core squarely in competition with AMD's Ryzen 9 12 core. While the 10900 series is interesting in that Intel are now offering 10 cores in a mainstream part, definitely due to the pressure of the Ryzen 9 3900X and 3950X, I think the most juicy parts in this lineup are actually in the Core i7 range, so let's take a look. Similar setup to what we had in the Core i9 range with standard F, K and KF SKUs at a range of price points. But the big news here is the inclusion of the Core i7 10700K and 10700KF, which are essentially offering 9900K specifications at a much lower price point. So this is the full eight cores and 16 threads with all core turbos up to 4.7 gigahertz and a max clock speed of 5.1 gigahertz. Previously, the 9900KF would set you back around $480. Now Intel will be offering that performance at just $350, which is a pretty huge move for them. I think there were a lot of question marks over whether Intel would lower pricing with this generation, and by shifting down what was a Core i9 part into the Core i7 range, well, they've done just that. In terms of competition, the 10700KF, which in my eyes is more appealing than the $25 more expensive 10700K, is going up against the AMD Ryzen 7 3800X and the Ryzen 7 3700X. The 3800X is currently priced around that $350 mark, so that's identical to the 10700KF, while the 3700X will be about $50 cheaper at $300. 
On a pure performance basis, this sounds like quite a compelling purchase and certainly the battle between Core i7 and Ryzen 7 will be heating up thanks to these new processors. Generally speaking, the 9900K offers similar productivity performance to AMD's 8-core while packing better gaming performance. The reason why it's been so easy to recommend the Ryzen 7 has been price. AMD's offering has simply been cheaper, but that's not the case with the 10700KF coming in around the mark of a 3800X. Now we have a situation where Intel could be offering similar performance at a similar price, with the 3700X being that little bit cheaper. It'll be very interesting to see where everything ends up and whether the 10700KF is actually available for $350. It's also worth mentioning the Core i7-10700F, which brings 8 cores, 16 threads, and a 4.6GHz all-core turbo at around $300. So this is Intel's competitor to the 3700X. Yes, it's a locked processor, but clock speeds aren't too far behind the 10700KF, so for those that aren't interested in overclocking, this could be a pretty decent buy. The Core i5 series is shaping up to be a decent battleground for Intel as well, mostly due to price reductions. The offerings here aren't anything new in terms of technology or performance, but Intel has brought down what used to be Core i7 performance into the Core i5 range. The configuration is a little different. Intel are now offering 6 cores and 12 threads here rather than 8 cores and 8 threads. But regardless, the Core i5-10600K basically becomes what the Core i7-8700K was and what the Core i7-9700K offered in performance. Previously, these Core i7 parts were around $350 to $380. Now we're getting the Core i5-10600K for around $260 and the 10600KF for around $240. Like with the 10700KF, that's a pretty substantial price reduction and allows Intel to be competitive in the Core i5 range once again. All that really needed to happen was for Intel to lower pricing, and rather than releasing 10th gen with dead-on-arrival pricing, they're basically done what they needed to do. At these prices, the unlocked Core i5 models aren't quite as compelling as the Core i7s as AMD is offering their six cores for less. The Ryzen 5 3600 is currently a $175 part, while the Ryzen 5 3600 is about $200. This puts the 10600KF around 37% more expensive than the 3600, for what is likely similar productivity performance and about 10% better gaming performance if we get 8700K level performance. So the value equation might not be quite there, but it certainly is a lot better than what Intel was offering with the largely uncompetitive 9700K. The other potential sleeper hit here is the Core i5-10400F, which might be bringing back the success of the Core i5-8400. At a $160 unit price, the 10400F offers 6 cores, 12 threads, and a locked clock speed that tops out at 4 GHz. So this will be a fair bit slower than an 8700K or 9700K type processor, but at the same price as the 9400F, we do get hyper-threading. And with a price tag lower than the Ryzen 5 3600, it'll be really interesting to see where this falls in the performance stack, especially for gaming. Below the Core i5 lineup, there's not much to get excited about. Intel's Core i3 range is still quad cores. We do get hyper-threading now, but pricing is a little high at $120 on the low end and $155 on the high end. Clock speeds are in the mid to low 4 GHz range all core, but with AMD offering a quad core for just $100 with Zen 2 technology, I don't think Intel will be offering the best budget value here. And despite user benchmark claiming that the Core i3-9350K is one of the best processors in history, Intel have actually scrapped the unlocked quad core for this generation. Similar story with the Pentium and Celeron lines at $90, we're looking at just a dual core process with hyper-threading, and then for Celerons, around that $50 price, it's a two-core, two-thread design. We are getting a full complement of chips from 10 cores through to two cores in two-core increments, but it's really those eight and six cores that look to be the most decent options in this lineup. In terms of other platform features, the 10th gen lineup will require a new LGA 1200 socket, so these CPUs are not backwards compatible with older motherboards. You'll need to grab a new motherboard, and starting today, you'll probably see a lot of news about Z490, B460, H410, and H470 options. We're not going to cover the entire lineup of each brand. There are so many models floating around out there, but you can expect us to test a lot of at least Z490 boards, in particular in the next few weeks. So what do these boards actually offer? Well, aside from stuff OEMs control, like VRMs, connectivity, and so forth, Z490 
isn't that much different to Z390. We'll see more 2.5 gigabit Ethernet solutions as Intel are officially supporting it this generation with their Foxville chip, as well as more Wi-Fi 6 support. Other than that, you can expect beefy VRMs and power delivery systems with Z490 boards to accommodate 10 cores running at 4.8 gigahertz or more. MSI's Godlike, for example, has 16 90 amp power stages, and even the budget Tomahawk has a 12 stage with an eight and four pin EPS connector. A lot of budget Z390 boards use just six or four phase designs, but that looks to be changing with Z490 to accommodate the requirements of the 10 core. As for B460 motherboards, they're being announced today as well alongside Z490, H470 and so on. Not a ton of interesting news on that front either. I did see some rumors claiming B460 would support overclocking, but I checked with Intel and they said it does not support overclocking. So that's that. Given we were basically at the heat output limits with a chip like the 9900K, Intel has made a few tweaks to help this situation with the 10900K. They've made the die itself thinner and the IHS thicker to improve thermal transfer. They're calling this thin die stim. So we are still getting a soldered chip, but with a thinner silicon die, it'll be easier for the heat to transfer out and then into the IHS and then of course into the cooler. Few overclocking enhancements as well, a refreshed Intel Extreme Tuning Utility will allow better voltage frequency curve controls, as well as PEG and DMI overclocking, and the unique ability to disable hyperthreading on a per core basis. Intel had some strange justifications for why you might want this for running applications that only use a certain number of threads, but this seems more like an enthusiast overclocking feature for maximizing performance, and even then I'm not sure it'll actually be that useful. For performance, Intel did make a few claims about where they expect new 10th gen parts to fall relative to the previous generation and three-year-old PCs. You can see 10% faster performance in PUBG, for example, over the previous generation. Checking the configurations used, it appears Intel are comparing the Core i9-10900K to the Core i9-9900K here, although in this slide here, it appears Intel are power limiting both CPUs to a PL1 of 95 watts for the 9900K and 125 watts for the 10900K, the default TDPs for each processor. While you could argue about in-spec versus out-of-spec behavior, with 9th gen parts, most motherboards ignored those limits by default. So it'll be interesting to see how these CPUs stack up when fully unlimited and whether that's the default for 10th gen as well. I suspect the margins could be a fair bit narrower when both are fully unleashed. Another interesting thing I spotted buried in the performance disclaimers is how they managed to claim the Core i9-10900K is the fastest gaming processor. It's not explicitly included on the slide that mentions that, but in these footnotes they've compared the 10900K to the 9900K and AMD Ryzen 9 3950X in 25 games with an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 2080 Ti, and they claim that the 10900K performed better in the majority of titles, and this is the, the game list in case you're wondering. There's nothing suspicious here, it's just unusual that a company would bury those sorts of details in the footnotes if the processor is actually the fastest in the majority of games. Surely I think that's worth a couple more slides with more information. We didn't really get a full breakdown or anything of those games in the slides, which I found a little bit strange. Anyway, overall, this is shaping up to be a more exciting and interesting launch than we initially expected. I was going through some of the news with Steve a few days ago. And we agree that in the Core i7 and Core i5 ranges in particular, the offerings here are better than we first thought they might be, especially considering the prices Intel have listed here. Whether or not retailers actually sell the chips at these prices is another question, and often at launch, prices have been inflated for Intel CPUs, but significant price cuts for eight and six core parts are very welcome. And really, this has been possible all along. Intel CPUs have been competitive in terms of performance, but they've been so hard to recommend based on their pricing, especially in the mid-range. This new lineup, which either reduces pricing or offers more performance in a given tier, depending on how you look at it, is exactly what Intel needed to do. They couldn't continue offering eight cores at nearly $500 and expect to be competitive, but now that that's looking like a three to $400 parts, yeah, a lot better. Of course, Still plenty of concerns here that we'll work through in our upcoming reviews and other content. One is platform longevity. AMD, of course, has been offering AM4 backwards and forwards compatibility for a while now, while Intel has just launched a new socket and platform for this 10th gen lineup. So those upgrading from previous chips need to buy a new motherboard. Intel aren't making any commitments on how long LGA 1200 and Z490 will last either. So we don't know whether this generation will support future CPU upgrades.
The other interesting discussion point will be Intel's 10th gen lineup versus AMD's upcoming Zen 3 lineup. This new Intel lineup looks competitive against current Ryzen 3000 processors, but they've been on the market for over nine months now, and AMD loves to reduce prices in response to competition, especially for products that have been available for a while. So we could see Intel's competitiveness eroded in the short term with price reductions and in the medium term with new CPUs later this year. So that'll be a very interesting story over the rest of 2020. As for launch dates for all of this stuff, I'm not 100% sure what I can and can't say with all the NDAs surrounding the motherboard, CPUs, and all that sort of thing. So I'm going to play it pretty safe and say that you should expect all that stuff in May at some point. Um, but yeah, I'm not 100% sure on the official dates and whether we can say those just yet. So yeah, be a bit conservative there. And that's it for this look at Intel's 10th gen processors. A bit of a discussion on the processors themselves, the specs, and also just our general thoughts on it. I think we're going to see a very competitive 10th generation lineup here and comparing it to some of the Zen 2 stuff is pretty exciting. I think there'll be a lot of um, great CPU comparisons that we'll be able to make on Hardware Unboxed over the next few weeks and months. So definitely subscribe for all of that coverage. Steve will be getting these CPUs soon and all that sort of thing. So he'll be, we'll task him with all the reviews. He does a great job of that. So yeah, check back on the channel for all of that stuff. You can, of course, grab some of our merch, which is still available for the next couple of days. Links to that in the description below. Patreon page is also there as well if you want to chat with us on Discord. And yeah, that's it. I'll catch you in the next one.